Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm uh, Professor Frank Lang, that's the principal at UHI. Uh, and my initial job is firstly just to welcome you all um, to this inaugural professorial lecture um, from Neil Simcoe. Um, and really just to do a bit of housekeeping initially, first of all, um, to welcome those of you on VC who are connected in with us. Uh, could I please ask you to mute your microphones? Um, during the presentation. Uh, and can I also advise you and the people here that the, the, the lecture is being recorded um, so that we can share it online for those that couldn't attend tonight. Um, there are no fire alarms planned. If the fire alarm goes off, it's not a drill, and please exit by this door here. And could I also ask everyone uh, in the audience here uh, please to make sure your mobile phones are on silent um, throughout the lecture. Uh, and I'll be saying a little bit more later on, but initially, could I ask Professor Clive Mulholland, Principal and Vice Chancellor of the University, to introduce the speaker, please. Thank you, Professor Lang. Thank you, Professor Lang. Thank you, Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the University and to our host here, Inverness colleagues tonight. And uh, can I welcome everybody on VC as well? Um, it's great to see so many people here this evening. Uh, it's an indicator, I think, of the interest that there is in, in Neil's novel lecture, so no pressure, Neil, tonight. <laughs> uh, um, Professor Simcoe began his career as a primary school teacher in England. He moved into teacher education at the University of Cambria in the early 1990s and worked in various lecturing posts prior to becoming the Dean of Faculty in 2002, where he led the largest provider of teacher education in England. Whilst there, he was seconded from his faculty role to assistant principal at St. Martin's College, and subsequently became Pro Vice Chancellor um, at the University. He played a significant corporate role in the formation of what was then the new University of Cumbria. Since joining the University of the Highlands and Islands, Neil has continued his professional involvement in teacher education through his close engagement with the General Teaching Council of Scotland. As Assistant Principal for Curriculum Growth at the University of the Highlands and Islands, Professor Simcoe has corporate responsibility for higher education growth across the university. However, in addition, he is currently Acting Vice Principal for Research holding leadership responsibility for the oversight of research activity and the enhancement and development of research teaching languages. The title of professor represents the highest level of academic achievement that can be granted by any UK university. It is reserved for an individual who is recognized as a leader in their field and has demonstrated excellence in their work. Upon appointment, they're expected to further develop this excellence and to maintain and develop their professional confidence. A professor is, therefore, someone of significant value to the institution, and this needs to be demonstrated and sustained. Being a professor, especially the University of the Highlands and Islands represents something unique. It goes beyond traditional management concepts of seniority and academia. It involves vision, leadership by example, and becoming a role model for less experienced staff and students. This award recognizes Neil's contribution to education, as well as his contribution to the management and leadership of both the University of the Highlands and Islands and the University of Cumbria. As regards research, Neil's own research output includes a number of published books and edited collections, chapters and books, and refereed articles in his specialist field of teacher education. <clears throat> Neil has a long-standing membership of both the British Educational Research Association and the Association for the Study of Primary Education. And in this connection, he has been a member of the National Steering Committee. 
arriving in the Highlands, they need to embrace the Gaelic language, laterally leading on our Gaelic language plan. As an avid Gaelic learner, he has undertaken a number of the university's Gaelic courses and is progressing well towards fluency. In tonight's lecture, Professor Simcoe will consider whether educators should aim to help learners achieve personal aspirations or if they should focus on meeting national and institutional objectives. Tonight, Neil has an opportunity to profess. I would like to welcome Professor Neil Simcoe to give his inaugural professorial lecture. Thank you. So welcome everybody, it's really great to see so many people here and there are folk here from England, uh, from other parts of Scotland, as well as from within our own uh, UHI uh, community. Gaelic is important for the university, Gaelic is important for me also, and therefore in part of the lecture I'll be using Gaelic with uh, immediate translation as we go along. So I'm going to speak for about, uh, in fact more than about precisely, 40 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got my watch here so I keep an eye on time. Um, and really, the, the lecture is entitled Having the Cake and Eating It, Meeting the Needs of Individuals in Contemporary Higher Education, Teaching and Learning. And in essence, it is all about this tension that sometimes exists between the role of higher education in educating individuals and the role of higher education in preparing individuals for society. So the, these things are sometimes uh, just, just opposed. So, well, I'll carry on while the slides are onto the screen there. Um, in terms of the overview of the lecture this evening, uh, what I'm planning to do is, first of all, revisit some important purposes of education, um, some overarching points of principle. I've got four short illustrative stories uh, to tell, which really embed these key points. Um, I've got two gentle brackets, pieces of theory, that I want to bring into the lecture. Um, I then want to look at uh, education as a global phenomenon, um, in terms of how we measure education. Uh, I want to come right way back then into uh, the National Student Survey, which is a really key metric, many folks will know, some won't, in higher education that we, that we have. And I want to also look at the teaching excellence framework, which again is a national um, uh, set of metrics really to measure uh, the output of higher education. And finally, I want to return to the purposes of education. That's great, thanks. So first of all, and, and you'll see several times I, I put up a slide with an onion, because really that is what education is about. That's what education is like, that's what it's about. Everybody in society, just about, has been through some educative process. Therefore, everyone has a view on education, whether that is articulated or not. But in order to un understand education, just like peeling an onion, you have, to un you have to go through the layers and to get to the depth of it and some of the complexities to enable you to, in my view, frame a perspective on education. And this is really underpinning some of the things that I want to talk about. So here are some overall reflections uh, to start us off. First of all, I believe, and I'm sure others believe too, that effective education is both life-affirming for individuals and is a source of societal, economic and social strength. <coughs> These two things should come together uh, because that is for the benefit of the individual, but also for the benefit of society. However, 
I believe that, and I will demonstrate this as we go through, that in contemporary higher education in the UK, um, there is this risk that society's needs are becoming out of balance from the needs of individuals. And my illustrative stories that I'll come to, I hope, spur the imagination in actually giving some meaning to that. I contest that this is not a new phenomenon, this balance between individuals and society. It's a phenomenon also which transcends all levels and sectors of education. Primary education, secondary education, further education, higher education, um, and, uh, and all, all sectors within that. And finally, and we come back to this at the end, uh, this notion that the individual and the society are not mutually exclusive, but are actually deeply connected. And the trick of it, if I can use that rather superficial word, is for those of us involved in education to understand that point and to practice in a way that links these two things together. So that, that's the, that's ref, those are some reflections. And what I want to do as we go along now is to um, go to the right way. What I want to do is to peel the onion. I want to get into the into the depth of it, into the detail of it, and then come back out to the big, big, big points of principle. That's my plan. My plan at Ackham. <laughs> so, four short stories, and these are partly biographical, um, but autobiographical. Um, but I hope that they illustrate this big point that I'm trying to make. Because all of these short stories, and there are different things, and they involve different sectors in education, illustrate this point that it's about the balance between education for individuals and for society cuts across uh, these phases, the points I've just made. So the first story, and this is partly autobiographical, is about um, this lady called Charlotte Mason, 1844-1923. Charlotte Mason uh, was an educational philosopher who founded, as it was called, the House of Education in Ambleside, in Cumbria, this is where I trained um, many, many years ago now as a primary school uh, teacher. And I went to that institution because of the educational philosophy that Charlotte's nation espoused. And what I really like is this quote, because it's, it's written in 1925, but it embraces this issue that is still current for us now. I'm going to read it because I love it. Now here is the most mischievous fallacy an assertion that a child is to be brought up for the uses of society only and not for his own uses. We launch children upon too arid and confined a life. Now, personal delight, joy in living, is a chief object in education. I find that inspirational uh, because it places the individual and the individual life at the centre of the purpose of education. Child-centred education, I suppose, in the jargon. Very differently, we move on to this um, man, Professor Robert McKeever, 1882 to 1970. Uh, Professor Robert McKeever, uh, Robert uh, McKeever as he was when he was younger, obviously, uh, was a, uh, um, a scholar uh, uh, and of some renown. Uh, he was brought up in Lewis, went to the Nicholson Institute in Stornoway, and eventually became a renowned sociologist and political scientist of global importance. And the reason that I've, I've um, cited him is because of the um, transformational impact that a new head teacher at the Nicholson Institute in Stornoway in 1890, or roughly, had on this man's life. Because his previous experience of education was dry and arid, and he was not inspired. He was not able to fulfill, uh, so he says, his, uh, his potential and his thirst, his hunger for knowledge, his hunger for education as an individual. And this, this is the quote, I won't read it, I'll read it on the screen, but this is the quote, juxtaposes um, a very traditional view of education, a transmission model with um, this word beauty of mathematical reasoning. Because just as life is beautiful, so should education be beautiful and individual. Third story. Back to the current time. Um, this is a picture of uh, BBP University in London, one of um, one of uh, England's private universities, institution I've been to to visit. 
probably not an institution that I would end up um, working in, and that would offend anybody, um, because um, in my field of teacher training, teacher education, they've just started uh, teacher education, this is what the prospectus says. And the key bit of it is, um, this is what students will do. We will review the evidence, calling to question popular but unproductive teaching methods, such as discovery-based learning, minimal teacher guidance, and a tailoring of lessons to people's individual learning styles. That says to me that individuals are not important in education. What is more important is a transmission view of education, a transmission of knowledge to, uh, to students or to children, whoever's being educated. And whilst there is evidence going the other way, there is, across the world, to use a colloquial term, a shed load of evidence about, um, about uh, learn learning, the importance of social interaction learning, all of these kinds of things. So I, I question the validity of what BPP University is doing in teacher education, and it'd be interesting one day to have that debate. Final um, story I want to uh, mention is, is very uh, autobiographical because this is the school I went to um, many, many years ago uh, in London. And as you can see there, some uh, colleagues around the room will remember this, it hit the news in August because a group of students was being excluded after AS levels uh, because the school thought that they would not be able to achieve the highest grades at A level to enable the school to preserve its reputation as set, you know, only producing the most outstanding young people. And what happened was that a group of young people that had, um, were effectively excluded from the school because their provisional results were only at only at grade B. Now, I think that it is educationally outrageous. I think it's wrong. I think it's wrong in terms of civil society. Um, I don't agree with it. And I think that um, it spurs that thought as to how, how have we managed within the UK context to get to that position um, where, where a school can do that. And this is one example um, there, one example. But we know that there are other examples, and actually we know in a different way that would happen right across the UK, including here in Scotland. It's food for thought. But I suppose these four stories for me <coughs> illustrate the point that this tension, in some respects, between the individual and society prevails in, over the course of time, um, and in different sectors and in different contexts. It is a big issue, I think, in education. So I want to move on now to the second uh, part of what I wanted to talk about, because um, this will provide, as well as the stories, some important context for the analysis that I move on to later on. And I will be gentle here, because I'm aware that in the audience there are people who are educationists, but there are people who aren't. Um, so I'll take you through this carefully. So the you know, word theory is, 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 is there. And there's two, two pieces of theory. The first one I want to touch on is this thing called the dilemma language. Uh, it's well known, Burlap and Burlap, 1981. I'll adapt it slightly. And why I put this along today is because Burlap and Burlap juxtapose on the left hand side this notion uh, of um, the, uh, this, this notion of, I suppose, a holistic individual. Uh, purpose in education, the whole person, you know, their emotional well-being, their intellectual well-being, their cognitive, cognitive advancement, their social well-being, on the one hand, with the, just the learner on the other. You know, is education about the whole person? Is it just about learning something? Is, with personally, my Gallic journey just about learning Gallic, or is it about a personal journey? The notion of personal knowledge versus public knowledge is education about the knowledge that each one of us builds up personally through our myriad of interactions, or is it primarily about knowledge that's in the public domain? Knowledge is content, knowledge is process. Is it about, um, what it says there, is it, is it about a, a body of content that is transmitted? Is it about the learning process, the learning journey? 
Is it given? Is it problematic? Are we allowed to ask questions and interrogate uh, issues and concepts? Is it molecular? Can you break it down into little chunks, uh, atoms of nuggets of knowledge? Or is it holistic? Do we see the whole, the whole of the, the whatever we are studying? Finally, is a student a client, a customer, or a person? And the issue I have here is that actually, in Burlap and Burlap, these things are put on opposite ends of the spectrum. In reality, I think they come together. And actually, education, uh, the purpose of education, spans across the whole of that dilemma language. That, that's how I would say it. Second piece of theory I want to move to is the, this thing here called the notion of an ecosystem. I'm just illustrating here, there's a picture there of Loch, Loch Broom. Uh, and of course, you see a beautiful picture, but what is also there is the idea that that picture is caused by a very complex ecosystem. The interaction of the flora, the fauna, the climate over millions of years, um, the individual interactions between uh, animals in the sea, on the land, etc., etc. I'm not a scientist, but uh, using the points uh, illustratively, this notion of an ecosystem. And just in the same way, colleagues, that you have Loch Room as an ecosystem, so too you have the classroom as an ecosystem. And I've got four slides there which illustrate four different learning contexts the lecture, what we're doing now, um, the sort of group seminar, the individual online, and the kind of um, activity-based learning. And the contention I have is that just as locked room is an ecosystem, so is the classroom an ecosystem. Because the meaning in those situations is built up minute by minute, hour by hour, session by session. Each individual in that classroom will have a different perspective on what is going on in that classroom. Um, the teacher will have a different relationship in a different learning relationship with every person in that classroom. It's complex, education is complex, and in order to understand, in order to bring meaning to education, we have to understand the complexity of education. So, taking it into a theory uh, element, here's the onion again, peeling the onion, um, looking at that in a little bit more detail, what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, Alinoch <laughs> Tunch a bunten lich gach seyerbuch polum, olichen, seminaren, earthenly earthen, eloina, agus collarchen, bc. And really what I'm saying there is captured in these points here. The learning environment is made up of minute by minute interactions involving all participants. It is therefore rich, complex, dynamic, and intricate. And actually, that implied, applies even in a situation like this, where effectively I'm transmitting knowledge. Because as we go around the room, each and every person will be interpreting what I'm saying in different ways. Some people might be thinking, that's just fascinating. Other people might be saying, don't get it. Other people saying, might be saying, why not come? Other people <laughs> might be saying, um, you know, that spurs something in my own, my own biography. So even in this learning environment, a traditional learning environment, the minute by minute by minute by minute interactions are there. The contention is that the learning environment has two major variable, variables: clarity and openness. And I'm going to come back to that in a moment. And it applies to all educational settings and all sphere, all sectors: primary, secondary, further higher, lecture seminars, face-to-face, -face, online video conference. That's my argument. And then. Um, looking at the, uh, I call it the dimensions of activity and ambiguity, it's actually at one level quite simple. In that, what we've got two dimensions there. We've got um, the degree of openness at the top, 
and we've got the degree of clarity at the side. The degree of openness is all about the degree to which students own their own time, their own learning, their own curriculum. It's about the student ownership uh, of their own learning. The degree of clarity is the extent to which there's clarity about what is expected, about how the learning, uh, learning process is explained. And what you can do is you can plot on that matrix, almost minute by minute, whether the learning, whether the, whether the classroom ecology um, is open and clear, closed and vague, uh, etc. That's that gives a way of describing this classroom ecology. And one more theoretical slide before we move on. What I'm trying to illustrate here is that the, that matrix, and you've got that, you've got that at each of the levels, can apply to the whole class context can apply to working in groups, and that's online as well as face-to-face, -face, and can apply to individuals. So this illustrates the, the ecosystem. This illustrates the ecosystem. This illustrates why education is complex uh, and rich and intricate and exciting and dynamic, all those things. I'm going to move on now to, um, to raise some ideas from this analysis. First of all, I'm arguing that the quality of learning is dependent on the dynamic between participants in the ecosystem. In one level, common sense, but another level not. Between the teacher and the pupils, between the, teach between the lecturer and the students, uh, between the, the students and the students, between individuals and groups, minute by minute, hour by hour. And the quality of the learning is dependent on that dynamic. Secondly, we know that individual satisfaction is dependent on the dynamic between participants and will vary. So what might be satisfying to me as a learner might not be satisfying to my, my learning partner because my learning partner may, have, may be reacting to the ecosystem in a very different way. Education, in my view, is um, about the individual in that sense. Um, individuals, therefore, can be highly satisfied uh, also whilst not fulfilling their optimum learning potential. Uh, that's a key point as well. And finally, learning style, how an individual prefers to learn, will change over time. And, you know, I would have thought that in the, in the community here today, that if you reflected in your own learning journey, your learning style as an individual would have changed over time. Because education is life and life um, involves change and evolution as we go along the way. Further, um, I argue that purposeful learning can be uh, superficially unsatisfying because purposeful learning can be challenging, unsettling, and uncomfortable. So in other words, you, you can be, um, you can be satisfied as a, lear as a learner but actually your learning is superficial. Or you can not be satisfied with actually learning quite a lot, if you see what I'm saying. In other words, part of the learning journey is to be challenged, is to be unsettled, and is to be uncomfortable, but in a dynamic that is safe and secure. Does that apply to us? It certainly applies to me. Learning Gallic can be um, challenging, um, unsettling, and uncomfortable, but ultimately very positive. Doing a PhD can be those things. Um, doing a higher can be those things. Um, going to a night class uh, can be those things. So therefore, satisfaction, although, a use, if, although useful, is not, in my view, a proxy for learning. Just because someone is satisfied, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're learning. And therefore, in conclusion on this part, effective teaching is about the ability to adapt to individual learners within the ecosystem. That, colleagues, is a challenge in the teaching. And that is one reason why my story about Sonoma's Grammar School uh, disturbs me, because um, the question I have is whether the teaching was deeply effective. Effective teaching is about the ability to adapt. Uh, and that's a challenge, whether you're a primary school teacher or a university lecturer. That's the challenge there. So, We've explored um, the dilemma language, we've explored the notion of ecosystem, uh, we've explored, begun to explore this, this 
um, link between uh, individuals and society. What I want to turn now, turn to now, is the um, we're moving much more into the higher education space. Um, and I suppose contextually, one of the things I want to talk about first of all is the notion of marketization, because we know that in world in in, the, in worldwide, it's you know, marketization is increasing. Market steering is replacing government steering or or, uh, or supplementing. And we know also the UK is a good example of this because um, of the differences between the four countries. And in Scotland, uh, we know, for example, that marketisation had not progressed as far as it has in England, and yet some of the same metrics uh, apply. <coughs> My view is that marketisation in education is a reality. Uh, and therefore, <coughs> we have to accept that we want to be in education as professionals, we have to accept that reality, we have to embrace it, and we have to recognise it. There's no point, I think, in dismissing it. It's something that has to be embraced and recognised uh, there. And marketization leads to measuring education. And here's a couple of international examples just to, to get us going. Um, in China, uh, there has been this, uh, this notion, this, this exercise called the undergraduate teaching evaluation. Whilst in Australia, uh, there, is, there are or have been key guiding criteria for excellence. I selected these two because they're very different approaches to measuring higher education within a market-driven economy. So in China, we have this undergraduate teaching evaluation. It's designed to assess the quality of, quality of undergraduate teaching, the quality of undergraduate teaching. But yet, the first cycle of this evaluation focused on the macro factors influencing university teaching, facilities, equipment, and regulations. Um, micro factors related to learning were underrepresented, and lessons learned, second cycle built on self evaluation of learning and teaching. But the point I'm trying to make here is that in China, it was the, uh, in the, in the first example, Although it was about a teaching evaluation, it was not evaluating teaching and learning. It was evaluating things which influence teaching and learning, and there's a clear difference between these two things. In Australia, by some contrast, uh, this, this isn't current because things have moved on in Australia, but these are the guiding criteria for uh, evaluating learning and teaching. You'll see the difference. Approaches to teaching that influence both way to inspire, development of curriculum resources that reflect a command of the field, approaches, assessing the feedback, fostering and learning, etc. I won't read those other things out there, but you can see the difference between the two jurisdictions um, in the approach. And of course, across the UK, um, and uh, specifically here in Scotland, here are some of the organisations that, that many folk around the room here will know that are involved in measuring education in some form or other. That's the world we live in. We are measuring education. There are it's a metrics-driven system, and that's fine. There's nothing in principle wrong about that, but it is it is related, of course, to the whole business of marketization. And I want to touch on or more than touch. I want to look at in one specific um, um, metric uh, quite closely, which is the National Student Survey. I'm conscious that some folk in the audience may not be. Uh, familiar with this, so just to very briefly what it is. It was launched in 2025 in England, Wales, Northern Ireland. Um, Scotland was slow to embrace the National Student Survey. Scotland came in later. It's a measure of student satisfaction for all final year undergraduate students, um, and they respond to a series of statements on an online survey um, in all of some of these areas here, teaching, learning opportunities, assessment, feedback, and so forth. That's what it is. And I can remember when it came in, I was in England at the time, Vice Chancellor at the time, and I remember the words asked me to ride shotgun on the National Student Survey across the university. It was, an important, it was important then, and it still is now. And there's a couple of examples I wanted to give of the statements, because they illustrate the points about the purpose of education. First of all, uh, these are actual statements that the students would rate from one to five. First of all, staff are good at explaining things. Secondly, staff have made the subject interesting. Courses intellectually stimulating, 
my course has changed, challenged me to achieve my best work. And then, and I'll come back to comment on this in a minute, from the learning side of it, my course has provided me with opportunities to explore ideas or concepts in depth, provided me with opportunities to bring information and ideas together from different topics, has provided me with the opportunity to apply what I've learned. Now, I actually think that across those <coughs> statements, there is a really nice balance uh, coming back to the openness and the clarity, because what we've got there is the statements that are, are, um, are if I go back, statements that are, uh, staff are good at explaining things. That's a closed thing. That's what I'm doing now. I'm articulating a body of knowledge. But there are also statements in there which are much more personal and individual. My course has provided me with opportunities to explore ideas or concepts of death. You know, and these very carefully put together, of course, it was tested to death, and I think those statements are good in terms of uh, a measure of satisfaction. So let's just feel the onion a bit more. Let's just go beneath, beneath the surface. And here, I want to draw a distinction between uh, authentic satisfaction and surface satisfaction, because I think sometimes we are in danger of the National Security Survey being deceived and measuring a surface level of satisfaction is a question mark I have. What I mean by authentic satisfaction as a learner is that knowing that I am acknowledged as an individual in the ecosystem. So it's about that I'm not just as a VPP at university perhaps, um, you know, somebody uh, going in and out the door, but I'm actually an individual person uh, in the system. Knowing that authentic satisfaction derives from challenging and sometimes uncomfortable learning. Knowing that my criteria for satisfaction in the classroom dynamic ecosystem will vary over time. Knowing the relationship between my own reflection on the learning process and my, my sense of satisfaction. Moreover, being comfortable with a high degree of ownership over my learning, uh, understanding the different impacts of my learning, understanding the different impacts on my learning of different teaching styles. All these things are about my view about authentic satisfaction. Those things aren't surface. And to get from a surface satisfaction to an authentic satisfaction, a key variable is the role of the teacher or the lecturer or the online tutor. That is a professional skill. And I know, if, I'm, I'm sure as, as I'm talking, hopefully, you can maybe imagine lecturers or teachers or online tutors who gave you that authentic satisfaction. And perhaps you can also remember um, teachers or lecturers, uh, online tutors who were unable to do that. It's the dynamic between the teacher, the lecturer, the online tutor, and the child or the student that will lead to that authentic satisfaction and therefore to that <coughs> rich experience. Corollary of that is there we go, we're doing one way. surface satisfaction, trip advisor, nothing wrong with trip advisor, <coughs> sure we've all filled them in. But learning is not the same. Filling in the National Student Survey is not the same as filling in a trip advisor you know, off from a restaurant. It's something fundamentally different in my view. And therefore, surface satisfaction is perhaps about a view from a learner that the mechanics of the learning experience, the organisation and management of the environment and learning time, um, is what really matters. Now, of course, those things do matter. No one wants chaos in learning. But it's about understanding um, that you know, that's, there's a limit to that. Sometimes learners being uncomfortable with teaching that is open and that challenges new learning approaches, being comfortable purely with a transmission model of education. Uh, seeing the criteria for how I feel, uh, what I feel about satisfaction is static uh, over time. Being uncomfortable with owning my own learning, being uncomfortable with being independent in learning, uh, being satisfied only with a transmission uh, of knowledge view of learning and teaching, being uninterested in my own learning process is something that's done to me. These, I contend, are surface satisfaction, the other, the other elements I talked about, an authentic satisfaction.
of a national student survey through the dynamic between the lecturer and the student should reach where it works into a measure of authentic satisfaction. And if it happens, that is where individuals and society come together because it is the purpose of the national student survey. Moving on, um, I'm, I'm moving into the final uh, stages uh, of, the, of the lecture here. Um, I want to make some comments on the teaching access framework. Again, just for folk who aren't in the education system, at least in higher education, there's a new system for recognising teaching access to higher education, uh, provides information to help prospective students choose where to study, introduced in 2016, very slow take up in Scotland, illustrating again the fundamental differences between Scotland and certainly England. Institutions are awarded gold, silver or bronze according to their results. And it can be used in England to determine whether institutions can raise fees. And these are the core metrics <coughs> for it. So you've got a measure on the left hand side and the source on the right. Uh, and I'm not going to go through in detail, but the point I want to raise here is that the National Student Survey uh, in, this, in this iteration um, is dominant um, in the teaching access framework. It's the National Student Survey, it's the big, biggest things. We've also got a measure of learning environment through non continuation and uh, employment, further study, and so forth. So the teaching, the, the national definition of teaching excellence is related very closely to student satisfaction as a proxy, I suppose, for teaching excellence. Interestingly, this has just been renamed as the Teaching Excellence and Student Outcomes Framework, and the weight given to the, the uh, NSS is actually going down, as it were. Um, yeah. So, therefore, this is the key point for discussion, therefore, satisfaction, surface or authentic, is measured. That's the reality. I have no problem with that, it's, except when it is only surface satisfaction that is captured. Secondly, quantification of satisfaction is core to the, to the teaching excellence framework. It is a proxy for teaching excellence, and therefore within England, it determines whether an institution can raise fees. The key point is a measure of satisfaction essentially leads to a greater or lesser institutional income. So linking it together, NSS metrics are an aggregate measure, they're a very high level institutional measure. They don't sit easily with a dynamic learning and teaching ecosystem because, as we've seen in the classroom context, you've got this rich inter interaction between teaching and learning going on all the time. In the criteria, <coughs> learning is actually excluded, it's only teaching. And if you look back, if you remember back at one of the slides, teaching is a very transition model view of teaching. So a measure of learning is not directly in time. Uh, and, and therefore, in my view, and I think in some other view, TEF at this point doesn't measure teaching excellence. There's a disconnect between these two things um, there. Uh, and I've made the point already about monetization. But on a positive note, it's, it's good because TEF is giving teaching and research in higher education equal esteem. The research excellence framework related to research has been around for a very long time in various iterations. TEF and REF are now, are now there, so there's equality. Recognising and rewarding teaching is a good point of principle. Um, and um, it's right that MSS and TEF that this can drive up the standard of teaching. These things are very visible, very political and therefore um, you know, worthy of comment. And it comes back to that point I made about the reality uh, of metrics. So I'm moving, and I think I'm still just about within the 40 minutes, uh, to um, conclusions. Uh, Alistair Garlick, Agus and Nish, Vitolum, Glus and Urt, Gana Fasri Yeri, Den Olic Ho, Faran Chikmi, Gar, Kogunihan, and Ma, and Repress System Forum, so I'm moving to the final part of my talk, where I want to come to some conclusions about how the education system 
can meet the demands of both individuals uh, and society. Here we are. I mean, having the cake uh, and eating it. This is not a picture of my family. <laughs> So, some concluding thoughts. First of all, an effective education needs to do both these things. It needs to meet both the needs of individuals and it needs to meet the needs of society. Secondly, an effective education system balances these things carefully and successfully. And the question in the back of my mind is at the moment, just like my, the school I talked about, are we in danger of society, particularly uh, in other parts of the UK and getting these things out of balance. <clears throat> Thirdly, um, this is the point I'm making, the rise in marketisation potentially puts this balance out of risk, uh, puts this balance at risk. I've got a quotation here, which I'm, there's two quotations to conclude I'll just touch on. Uh, this commoditisation of learning destroys the potential for university education to be gen genuinely humbling and transformative and personal experience, a sometimes messy, stumbling exploration for students in which being comfortable and being uncomfortable is crucial for developing a valuable personal resilience. Strongly, strong words, not quite sure whether I would go quite so far, but the reality of learning is that latter bit. It's stumbling, um, it's messy, um, it's dynamic, all those things we've talked about. So, Metrics have the potential to determine whether the needs of society are being met. They have the potential to determine this. Satisfaction is a, is a potentially good measure of education, uh, but there is that critical, in my view, and overlooked difference between surface satisfaction and authentic satisfaction. Satisfaction cannot automatically, therefore, be a proxy for teaching excellence, teaching excellence although it can be part of the journey there. Authentic satisfaction, though, is an outcome of teaching excellence. It does matter. The National Student Survey does matter authentically, not just for the purposes of society and metrics. It matters for individuals. And the critical role of the lecturer uh, I touched on. So, therefore, what could a basket of metrics look like for teaching excellence? And here's some, uh, some high-level thoughts. First of all, I think that student satisfaction should be included, <coughs> but it should be that learning should be included in there as well as teaching. It's not just about teaching. Self-assessment and peer assessment, I think, are part of how metrics should be gathered within um, uh, within uh, a metrics driven uh, position. A lot of folk around the country talk about the importance of value added the difference between what someone comes into an institution with and what they leave with. What is, how can we measure that added value? And finally, uh, impact, of case, in, impact case studies. Within the research excellence framework, impact case studies, the impact that research has on society, are becoming very big. Why not in teaching can we have some measure of impact case studies as well? These are high-level thoughts and not, not conclusions. They're the points for discussed as much then. And then a final quotation I wanted to, to um, bring before you is, any metrics used to recognize excellent teaching should be those which truly represent improvements in student experience brought about by interactions between higher education institutes, teachers and students, rather than measures representing existing differences in the level of advantage in different university mission groups. That, colleagues, is my conclusion. I'm arguing that individuals and society's purposes of education come together, that we can measure these things in such a way that both recognises the individual and the society, uh, and society in the education system. Thank you very much. Warren Sang. Good to the chair of the University of Cork, and it's my great uh, honour and pleasure to be here today to propose a vote of thanks to, to Neil for that excellent uh, lecture that he's just delivered. 
I've certainly found it really, really stimulating and thought-provoking. There's a number of things which he's touched on there which really resonate with me. Um, we've heard from Neil uh, a couple of times. He alluded to the fact that education is this complex, big, huge onion. I suppose in the education field, I'm more of the shallops rather than the big Spanish <laughs> onion. But I, I, I did get the, a lot of what you were, you were driving at there. And I think that there was a few things which really, really drove home to me. Um, which I see in other parts of my experience and how important it is that we actually get things right. The marketization of education is something that is happening and we have to respond to it. It's happening in other fields that are just as important as well. We've seen it in health and social care, where in exactly the same way as people were looking at the micro factors uh, when they were coming in to assess the performance of a care home or a hospital, counting the number of plugs and the number of lights that were in a, a room, they were not looking at things like whether there was staff who had the time to sit and actually hold somebody's hand or to give a new person a cuddle. And that was the stuff that was really would make a difference to the experience that people had. I think we really need to be as, uh, as leaders within any institution, very careful to make sure that we are measuring and driving forward elements in our um, the, the people who we are interacting with, this experience that really make a big difference to them. I was really taken with the uh, case studies that you gave at the start. Um, I love to see things which talk about uh, fun and about beauty. That is what education should be about. I want to live in a world which is full of fun and beauty. But Colin, who actually runs a, a word check on every document that comes past them that's to do with education to see how many times the word fun actually <laughs> appears in it. And if it doesn't, he challenges the people, the authors of those reports. And I think that the first two examples that you gave were the type of education system that I want to be part of, I want to foster uh, within the university. And also, I think. Uh, are the sort of things that I know our learners want to experience. The last two examples, they were the antithesis of that. They were sucking the fun and beauty out of the education process and something I think we need to be very thoughtful about and guarded about if we're leading this organisation as we go forward. I was taken about the idea of satisfaction not being a proxy. Uh, no, you qualified that as being not a proxy for learning, but I think I'm going to take that forward as satisfaction of being a proxy for a lot of things, particularly when I'm serving up an early uh, uh, evening meal tonight. Um, but I think that is really, really important that we do look at the basket of measures that we are uh, looking at when we're looking at the quality and the value that uh, we are hopefully delivering to uh, our learners and also to the wider stakeholders that we have. So thank you very much, Neil, for what was a really thought-provoking and inspiring lecture tonight. And I think I can speak for everybody here and say that you have achieved not just surface satisfaction, but authentic satisfaction uh, in the, uh, the, the presentation you've given to us. So Neil, thank you very much for, for that fantastic time. Professor Crichton Lyon to uh, welcome Neil into the front of the Thank you. Uh, I was waiting for the questions to speak. I apologise. <laughs> please, can you take the question? Can I take some questions? I'll be taking my mask scan, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, are there any, uh, I take it, sorry, or if we've got a, a wee while for questions, yeah. yes. Yeah. Any, any questions from the audience? Yeah, or from VC. Uh, VC, please unmute your microphone. <laughs> please, go ahead. I'll ask the question in, in English to everybody. Um, <laughs> thanks uh, for, for that uh, very stimulating talk. Um, before I get to my question, I'll, I'll, I'll ask, make a comment um, on the richness of what you're saying. I suppose what I was 
uh, taking from uh, your discussion this evening is that you're, in a way you're saying learning is individual, um, but education is societal, or to use your own phrase, ecological, and therefore successful education is the optimal interaction of these two aspects, our attentions, even in, you, know, you allude to, to that also, the, the uh, attentions. However, the question I want to ask is, uh, is about marketization, if I could ask you to go into that in a bit more detail. Um, and the reason you piqued my interest, on the one level, you mentioned the discursive tensions around the school for grade eight students, and you questioned its educational values there. But on then the other level, you mentioned the notion of the acceptance of marketization from the point of view of metrics, simply <coughs> because it's become so naturalized uh, within the system. So I suppose the question I'm asking is, um, given this notion of naturalized marketization and recognizing this tendency to towards selecting for grade A students, are we accepting those two tensions uh, in the one go? Are we f falling into the trap that in saying that some marketizations are more equal than others? <laughs> Thank, thanks for the, the question. It's a, it's a complex question, um, but I'll provide a brief answer for as a starter. I think you have to say, if you take a step back, you know, what what marketization is about you know, in the secular world of work, in the world out there is is the notion that one hotel group might be better than another. And therefore at the individual you have metrics and you can choose one over the other, the price, quality of the room, whatever. That concept of marketization at a very high level, of course, is now being brought into education. And the problem, the issue with it, if handled badly is that individual groups, or <coughs> schools or universities or sector groups, or whatever it happens to be, um, what dominates <coughs> is the presentation to the market as opposed to the authenticity of what's happening you know, within each individual in that system. And that's where the tension is. And my thesis today really is that if, if you handle the metrics which underpin that system correctly, you can actually have your that's the gist of what I'm saying. Um, yeah, that's the gist of what I'm saying. And I'm very happy to um, articulate it more fully uh, in a one to one conversation. Uh, any more questions? I check on BC. Anyone on BC wanting to ask a question? Yeah, that was great. I really, really enjoyed that. I mean, when you were starting to talk about the difference between, as you described, surface and authentic satisfaction, my immediate thought is that this is way too binary a description. But what you've just done is you've articulated, I think, a more sensitive and an intelligent role to look at the way in which um, something such as the NSS can be used in order to uncover the authentic and, and, and rather look at the surface. So how do we do that? How do we actually give value to the NSS yeah. within the authentic context? Yeah, that's a really, really interesting question, Chris. Thank you. I think, I think the key, the key point there is how we persuade uh, our uh, staff, our teaching staff, to see that the NSS can be used uh, as a way to inform fresh thinking about our own. Uh, practice in the classroom or the online or whatever. And I think that how we do that is through uh, staff development, through um, through actually rich and deep staff development. Not not only in the you know, real world, not, not I mean, NSS needs to be presented as important, of course it's important, but what is more important in the long term is that it is presented as an opportunity for personal reflection in terms of this student, student satisfaction. And I think the key to that is how we bring staff along with it, how we educate staff, how we have that discussion. And how that discussion is more than just about the, the surface, even though the surface is important, how we get the scores up. Because if we get to the deeper levels, we can therefore influence, actually, the scores at the end of the day, the two things come together. So I think the role of staff development is critical in that journey. 
I'm, I'm sorry to take some I just wanted to follow on, Neil, Hi. Um, follow on to what you were saying there, in that if we flip what we're saying in terms of the fun and the beauty of learning, we also have to acknowledge the messy, emotional, and uncomfortableness of it. If we're acknowledging that for the learners, we have to acknowledge yeah. that for us as staff. Yeah. And so for us to engage in a deeper level of staff development, we have to recognize the fun and beauty of yeah. developing ourselves as individuals, but also that it's messy, emotional, yeah. Yeah. and uncomfortable. I totally agree, Alice, and I think that, that the, my reflection on that comment is that just as I'm, this is a, in a dilemma language, I'm not having it as diametrically opposed, so too is that true for the role of the learner and the role of the teacher, because I think you were implying this, and I know this, and you know this, but the key thing is that as teachers, we never stop learning, and I think I think that's, that's the other point, that the, the, the inter the, the, the roles between learner and teacher should ebb and flow in, in, in a dynamic in that ecosystem. Okay, I think we've got to ask one question, just by Gary's <laughs> um, Curriculum for excellence. It's not about the ecosystem between learners and teachers. Um, do, you, do you think curriculum for excellence was a failed concept or a lost one? Even in a marketized environment, the market demand would be different. Learners would be looking for a different sort of learning and experience. So I'm sorry if that was conventional. I didn't mean it to be that way. I've, I've, not tried seen change, <laughs> I've not seen the change in the learners coming through in the way that we might have anticipated. That, that is a, that's another lecture, <laughs> and I'm not going to give another lecture. Um, in brief, my own view, it's a personal view, I think the curriculum, curriculum for excellence is a curriculum that actually has huge potential because it, 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 is, you know, it, it celebrates interdisciplinarity, it focuses on the learner journey, uh, all of those sorts of things. It thinks outside subject boxes. Um, so, in principle, I like the, the um, curriculum for excellence. Um, in principle, it should get to a point where the kind of learners that we see in further higher education going through are the kind of learners who have those that authentic satisfaction that you are saying. Have we have we got a way to go in progressing that point? I would probably say we do nationally, um, and you know. There's a, there's a lot of ongoing work to embed it and to take it forward because it was such an enormous change uh, in the system. So, in short, I'm saying, in principle, yes, but in practice, there's a lot of work to do to take it to that stage and to, to enable it to fulfill its potential. Because the final thought, because curriculum X for excellence, in terms of that matrix I said, showed, is more actually about open learning and clear learning to teach and learn in an open and clear way is harder than in a closed and clear way. So, you know, the challenge I think for teachers and learners in group directions is higher, but the goal is a is in my view a better goal. But I don't think we're there yet in, in the country. Thank you, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> No more questions. Um, I, I have one more task, which is, is to formally welcome Neil um, to the professoriate. Uh, and, and as others have said, um, the, the term professor can mean a lot of things. A professor undertakes a number of very significant roles within academia. And, and literally, professor derives from Latin person who professes, um, being an expert in arts or in science as a teacher of the highest rank. Um, professor is an accomplished and recognized academic. Um, but more flippantly, I've seen it defined as a professor is someone who can solve a problem that you didn't know you had in a way that you don't really understand. <laughs> and that falls flat, Neil, so have we, we managed to follow your, your talk <laughs> very 
very, very clearly indeed tonight. That's it. And um, it's a key thing if you link back to the word profess, they talk, professors talk, they articulate ideas and concepts and hypotheses. Uh, they have debates, they challenge conventional and current thinking, they create new knowledge and new thinking. Now, Neil and I were chatting a couple of days ago about the first time that we talked ever, um, which was when we recruited Neil and, and we phoned up for that informal, if you might find out more about the post, and, and I was the contact point. And Neil asked me what I remembered. You don't mind this, he did genuinely a couple of days ask me what I remembered from that initial discussion. Um, and I remember, I'm being very honest here now, that for most, you wouldn't have known this, but for most of me to have my feet up on my desk. <laughs> um, I remember that it was quite a long conversation. Uh, and you definitely professed. But within that, what came across clearly was your enthusiasm um, and your tangibility. Um, and indeed a wealth of experience and expertise that you've already built up in, in previous roles. So you were a professor, um, but that, that um, prophesization was very, very welcome. And did you full credit? It clearly indicated, even over the phone, even before we met face to face, that you were somebody that had a huge amount of experience and potential value being a little bit mercenary about the CUHI in terms of where it was in its particular journey. So this is all very well, what the professors actually do, what do they really do? You said they can be teachers, scholars, uh, or researchers in universities. They can also lead to administrative or man managerial functions at a high level, as dean or as a head of department. Um, or as a vice principal leading a particular function within a university. Um, so Neil clearly has done all of that, both within UHI and in previous institutions. And if that's not enough, they also act as ambassadors for their institutions, and they represent their university in a wider public and professional, and indeed even political context. And again, Neil does that to great, great effect and to great extent that that's not just through his work with the GTC, um, but also representing UHI with many, many stakeholders, Scottish Government, other educational institutions, and a wide range of employers. And they are consequently re ultimately recognised within the communities within which they're working. And I think it's, it's to Neil's great credit that he's, he's extending that community particularly through his current engagement with the Gaelic language and, and presence around Somer Ostig in the Gaelic speaking community. Um, they are fundamentally aspirational role models for progressing academics um, and, and younger individuals coming through behind them within, academic, uh, within academia and within universities and in our context, within UHI's particular context, within the college sector as well. Scholarship, scholarly thinking, thinking about education, professional practice in these areas are certainly not the sole domain of the universities. Um, now, by the standards of most other universities, we, we still sometimes refer to ourselves as developing um, or young. Um, I would like to suggest that we're, we're by no means an infant or a child. If not at that level, I prefer to see UHI now in playing the realms of the unruly teenager. It's beginning to shout a little bit more, beginning to make their voice heard a little bit more widely, and more importantly, an institution that has an emerging sense of identity, um, of aspiration, and with a character and a personality of its own. And we have a growing professoriate that is helping us to do that to underpin that maturation and to develop that personality in a wide range of subjects, including <coughs> diabetes, Nordic studies, archaeology, history, digital health, marine science, pedagogical research, and through individuals like Neil, education was a research discipline in its own right. And this represents that professoriate, which Neil is now a member, part of what we are, one face of UHI, a very traditional and important element 
nonetheless a traditional element with all strengths within an innovative and very unique university model. And we're very happy to add Neil to that list, recognising his achievements to date in his own professional academic field of education. Um, as a teacher, as an academic leader, and as a manager within UHI and within previous institutions. And we're also very happy to uh, admit him to the professoriate in recognition of what he has already done for this university and looking forward to the future contributions that we know he's going to make to our further growth, maturation, and development. So please join me in welcoming um, to the professoriate formally. University of the Highlands and Islands, Professor Neil Zunko. Thank <laughs> you. 